This film employs dramatic reenactments. All words spoken by actors are exact quotations drawn from the interviews, journals, and the memoirs of those who fought. St. Lawrence begins to widen to the sea on the 10th of November, 1950. A strange and terrifying event is about to happen to villages that line the riverbank north of Quebec City. Few villagers still have any idea that the event is a direct link to one of the deepest secrets of the Korean War. On this November day, the story begins at Goose Bay, Labrador. A U.S. Strategic Air Command B-50 bomber takes on a secret cargo. The cargo is the largest bomb in the U.S. arsenal, the Mark IV. With a nine kilogram nuclear trigger, this becomes an atomic bomb. The bomb is loaded without the trigger. Nevertheless, the bomb's three tons of high explosive makes it bigger than any conventional weapon ever dropped. At the onset of the Korean War five months earlier, the U.S. secretly asked Canada for permission to deploy an atomic attack squadron at Goose Bay, only five hours flying time from targeted cities in the Soviet Union. The B-50 is returning one of the bombs to its home base in the U.S. when over the St. Lawrence, the aircraft suddenly develops engine trouble. First one engine, then a second. Following emergency procedure, the pilot prepares to jettison the bomb. Setting it to explode at 775 meters. It's 4 p.m. A moment to remember for those below. Newspapers the next day report an earth-shaking explosion, producing a towering column of yellow smoke almost a kilometer high. Villagers report the ground shaking for 40 kilometers in every direction. A cover story is quickly put into place. The authorities lie, saying the flight was routine. The explosion, just a small practice bomb. This is part of the secret history of the Korean War the camouflage put over the vast and clandestine nuclear battle plan being readied in case the U.S. and its allies have no other means of winning the war. But before resorting to the bomb, America's most famous general will launch a desperate sea invasion of Korea. This is the South Korean port of Incheon. More than 50 years ago, U.S. Marines were storming the seawall, surprising the communist defenders. 50 years ago, come here, I'll fight. At Incheon today, a different surprise, a moment of serendipity for visiting veterans from a class making a school visit to a memorial. His was a dark war, seeing Korean children suffer. 
and he wasn't much more than a kid himself. So this is a moment to say. My name, Donald, you know Donald Duck? Yes, Donald. Donald Gill. Gill. Don Gill from New England. He was 18 and not prepared for what was coming. Let's show you some pictures. Inch, inch on Soul Road. This here coming up the street is me. Enchon Soul. Do you know Megado? Makata? He army. The soldiers and the children come to see the statue of the controversial General Douglas MacArthur at Inchon. Gill is here with Canadian combat veteran John Bishop. John. They shared MacArthur as a commander. I, I, I do not recall MacArthur. Maybe did. This looks more like Patan coming to shore. I have returned, right? Uh, I thought the same, even as a Canadian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people love them. A lot of people don't care for them. It is fatal to enter any war without the will to win it. In war, you win or lose, live or die. And the difference is just an eyelash. It is September of 1950. General MacArthur is in Japan at his supreme headquarters for Asia and putting a brave face on it. But the 70-year-old commander is losing the Korean War. MacArthur is preparing a new plan, a bold strategy to turn the war around in Korea. The plan calls for US forces trapped at Pusan to be landed at Incheon and surprise the North Korean enemy from behind. It is a risky plan. At Incheon, the tides are high. They recede, leaving mud flats. If the timing is wrong, this will ground an invasion fleet and make them sitting ducks. MacArthur dismisses the danger and stakes his reputation. We shall land at Incheon, he declares, and I shall crush them. On the 12th of September, 1950, thousands of US troops are filing aboard transports, embarking for Incheon. Bill Childress, poet and soldier, writes about the sensation of going aboard a troop ship. We wound inward like slaves in some gigantic pyramid, selected by our pharaoh for burial against our wills. Desperately short of craft for an invasion, the US is using ships and crews from the defeated Japanese Imperial Navy. fleet weathers a Pacific storm, then skillfully negotiates the tide at Incheon, surging ashore in two waves 12 hours apart. Don Gill and the first Marines arrive just before dawn and under fire. We got up against the seawall. We had two wooden ladders. We had to climb up the ladders to get onto the seawall. The first night, my platoon didn't take any casualties. We took 17 to 19 prisoners. I'll show you how green I was. I kept hearing bumblebees. So I said to a Sergeant Evendorf, I said, hey, Sarge, I said, this place is full of bumblebees. Now remember, I'm 18 years old. He said, bumblebees, and he listens for a second and he hears a bullet ricochet off the ground, and when it tumbles through the air, it sounds like the, the wings of a bumblebee. 
He said, you stupid SOB, you're being shot at. Get out of there. So I rolled over to the side of the road and the bumblebees went away. Within Sean Secure, MacArthur comes ashore. His dangerous plan has succeeded brilliantly. There is no premonition that this triumph will be his last hurrah. The landing at Inchon and the U.S. advance has changed the course of the war and is having a deep impact on every Korean. Yoo Chun Do is a retired physician living in Seoul, South Korea. But in the autumn days of 1950, she was on the other side, a doctor serving the North Korean army. She joined their cause hoping to build a revolutionary Korea with land reform and an end to feudalism. The new U.S. offensive is shattering her dreams. All across the land, North Korean forces are being bombed and napalmed. Marines are advancing, and North Koreans are retreating. Horror is coming. And I bet you that's old footing, maybe. With Canadian combat veteran John Bishop, Don Gill is trying to find the battlefield where well, the what's, nightmare what's began. Gone are the levees. He's getting close. The bridge on that side was blown out. This here would have been a levee, you know, an old right. earthen right. levee with a dirt road on top of here. Then they said, First Platoon Baker Company, forward. Don Gill flashes back, remembering every moment entering a Korean cornfield, sensing an enemy is coming, a North Korean enemy that doesn't know the Americans are so near, an enemy known by one word. The Koreans, we refer to them as gooks. Marines set up an ambush, and the North Koreans fall right into it. Don Gill and his platoon of 45 men suddenly realize there's more, many more North Koreans coming, still unaware the Marines are in their path. We are way outnumbered. The only thing in our favor is they're coming over in 15 and 20 at a time. Everybody gets shot. And we just cut them down. It was merciless. Cut them down. Some would get up and start running into the pond so you couldn't see them. Some would get killed in the corn field. If you look back, all you saw into the corn fields was bodies. Not one of us was wounded. As we go by them, a group we shot 
some of them got up in back of us. Now, if they you get up in back of us, we're, we're in deep doo-doo. They have no reinforcements. The Marines now get a grim and bloody assignment, kill the wounded. Somebody assigned a man to shoot everybody on the ground. When you reshoot a man on the ground, he bounces. The bullet passes through him, hits the ground, ricochets, it comes up through their back, and they bounce up in the air. And this kid, he doesn't want to be doing this. And I got so nervous, I was trembling so bad, I said, Shoot him in the head. Shoot him in the head. Shoot him all in the head. And, and then I said to myself, gee, I said that? You know? I, and, and then he starts shooting everybody in, in the head. Near the end of the action, Two North Korean soldiers try to surrender. Gil's friend, Blanchard, is ordered to execute one. He was trembling, and he said in a low, soft voice, I, I can't. So we took the two prisoners. And then a South Korean Marine unit moved through us. So somebody gave them our two prisoners. So around 15 minutes later, 10 minutes, from the back of this hill, you hear, <laughs> and we all looked at each other, we says, that's the end of those prisoners. What we did, a normal human being wouldn't do it. But our superiors, whether sergeants, lieutenant, he gave the order to protect his men. Because if they got up, we were dead. Nobody committed a war crime. He probably never slept with I say he, I don't know who said it. He never slept very well since that day, but he gave the right order. Seoul, the South Korean capital, soon becomes a battleground for Don Gill and the 1st Marine Division. fight for every street, every building, with combat photographers in the thick of it, trying to capture the action. Marguerite Higgins of the New York Herald Tribune is also there, the only woman war correspondent. The United States Marines blazed a bloody path into the city. The going was particularly tough for Charlie Company of the 1st Marines in the center of Seoul. We didn't know the road was heavily mined until a medic jeep raced ahead of us. The jeep blew up directly in our path. Of the three in it, only the medic survived and his torn body and shredded bloody face were a ghastly sight. After the massacre, Gill's platoon is in such shock, they march through a minefield, totally oblivious. Morale is non-existent in the front line. 
You win a battle, you don't jump up in the air and win number one. Everybody's sad, everybody's grieving, and you just feel lucky that you're breathing. Then, then as the chain of command goes up, they all get morale and happy because of what you did. The Marines capture Seoul, and General MacArthur flies in from Japan for the celebration. One officer says he gives it more attention than Incheon, orchestrating the return of Sing Min Ri, complete with a parade to welcome the rightist leader back to the South Korean capital. I moved at once to have the government of Korea re-established in Seoul. President Ri clasped my hand and said, we admire you. Tears streaming down his cheeks. We love you as the savior of our race. Ri is now well positioned to continue a witch hunt against his enemies. In the next two years, his regime will execute 100,000 opponents. You lived if you were lucky, you died if you were not, is a line from one of Yu Chun Do's poems. After serving as a doctor in the North Korean army, she is now among refugees trying to get home. 그 미군들이 있는데 그 앞으로 지내갔는데 이렇게 지내가니까 헤이 베비 어디로 가느냐고 양쪽에서 물어 그냥 혼자서 그냥 아무도 없는데 이렇게 가고 있으니까 그래서 내가 그냥 그때 어 투서울 투서울 나는 그때 긴장을 했지만도 웃었는 것 같아요. She is apprehensive because Sigmund Rhee vigilantes are pulling suspected communists from lines of refugees and beating them, often the last stage before summary execution. Two 이러면서 그냥 그러네. 그러니까 그 묵짓해가지고 커뮤니스트 커뮤니스트 이러는 거야 나를 보고. 그래가지고는 이제 그때 정신이 나서 I'm not communist. I'm a student. 그 밀치면서 나를 손을 잡고 그냥 자기한테 데리고 가서 자기 있는 대로 저저 집차에. 그래가 자기 그 집차 앞에 밤바에다가 나를 이렇게 올려주더라고. 그래 밤바에서 이제 올라갔지. 옛날 밤바가 크나 그게 집차. 밤바 올라가서 이랬으니까 누가 막 초콜릿들을 막 사방에서 갖다 주는 거야 그냥. 그래 초콜릿이라 안 안고 그냥 막 들지 그때 싸 울었다고. <웃음> A U.S. propaganda film tells a similar story. Candy, chewing gum. For the kids. But you have to teach them how to eat it. Poor frightened little fellows. Most of the soldiers see a different war. In his battle, Don Gill remembers a child orphaned in the Cornfield Massacre. I pass a woman laying face down, and she's full of bullet holes, and sitting at her head is a little girl. 
and the little girl's left arm is gone. So our Navy corpsman, I called him. I said, there's a kid here, you, you better take care of her. And she's one of these cute little oriental children with the hair cut, uh, you know, how that... And she's looking up at me like this, sitting down, and, and as I go, she just looks, she doesn't cry, she isn't moaning, and she just watches me walk by. And I just continue down with the group. To this day, I often wondered what happened to that little girl. <laughs> In the Korean War, the suffering of the children is terrible to behold, a theme echoed by the soldier poet Bill Childress. They lie in the road like broken stalks, children with bellies swollen, and all the flowers of their faces, petals all torn, and the rags of their threadbare clothes. Mother, we give them everything in our packs and still bemoan so sadly. More with eyes of stone. These kids will never sing again. Oh, mother, wish me home. With just one field of Kansas grain, what I can do for them. North Korean history speaks of a glorious fighting withdrawal after the Incheon landing and their defeat in Seoul. Kim Tae-hwa was a 23-year-old battalion commander. Even in retreat, the North Korean army is a dangerous fighting force, as Don Gill and his company of Marines are about to discover. So we start down the dirt road. The first three guys leading go down, they get shot. Am I right? Staff Sergeant Brink, he's right behind us. He's laying on the ground, you know, flat on the ground. And I don't know what happened to his mind because he left his carbine on the ground. He stood up, he grabbed his stomach like this, and he says, ho, 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 they can't shoot me. The second he said that, boom, he goes over. We can hear him grunting. So Holloway says to me, let's get him. Holloway gets back to Brink and he bends over to pick him up. When he bends over, he gets shot through one cheek, comes out the other cheek, he comes down looking at me. He says, stay there, Gil. Turns around again, grabs Brink, he drives Brink back, and he's mad. He's ripping. Bullet comes in under here, goes through his nasal passage, top of his roof, through his mouth, and comes out underneath his cheekbone. Then touch a bone. So Holloway says to me, Don. He says, would you go into that building and see if we can use it?
I run over into the building. And, and they're firing traces through the building. It's coming at one side, going out the other. No, I, I gotta build up courage to run back in the middle of that, in fact, the uh, hallway, and tell them it's no good. Not realizing the peril, more Marines are right behind Gil. I said, whoa, don't come in here, don't bring your men in here, it's a death trap. He brings all his men in there. Flanagan, born Bruno. Born and Bruno, 18 years old. The kid who stood up the longest, he gets shot. The other kid, 18 years old, he gets scared. He jumps up. He gets shot. He fell to the ground. He said one word. He said Carmen. And he died. Now we're in a building we can't get out of. Before the day ends, just about everybody in that building, including me, gets shot. We get back to the cornfield. We carry the wounded to the helicopters, and they carry them out. U.S., U.N., and Korean casualties are mounting fast. The U.S. alone has more than 15,000 dead, wounded, and missing and the war is not yet 90 days old. In China, at the summer residence of the leader, the mood is somber. Mao Zedong receives reports that UN forces are preparing to invade North Korea and threaten China. Mao chooses neutral India as a messenger, warning the West that any attack on North Korea will be seen as an attack on China. Jubilant and confident after the Incheon landing, the US administration now feels invulnerable. The president and his secretary of state pay little heed to warnings from China. Military historian Bin Yu. They treated Chinese official warnings as uh, bluffing. Uh, these are either propaganda or those communicators like the Indian ambassador to Beijing. They were actually pro-communist. How could you trust this guy? So Washington uh, dismissed those warnings. But those when you turn to be real. General MacArthur has been authorized by Washington to expand the war into North Korea, but to do so without provoking China. MacArthur, on the other hand, intends to conduct an unrestricted invasion. My mission is to clear out all North Korea, to unify it, and to liberalize it. Even before Washington gives the go-ahead, Sigmund Rhee's army crosses the 38th parallel, invading North Korea. MacArthur's army is right behind. Loads of infantry and heavy tanks moving north. Early October, U.S.-led forces are advancing through the mountains on a divided front, moving towards the Yalu River, the border with China. In China, preparations are underway for war with the United States. It is an immense decision, not lightly taken. Nothing alarms the Chinese more than the threat of the atomic bomb. The U.S. is repeatedly testing the doomsday weapon in the Pacific. 
The threat of the bomb is keeping the Soviet Union at arm's length from the war. But China decides the threat must be faced. Leading the assessment is one of China's top young commanders, General Du Ping. Woman的结论是,决定战争胜负的是人,而不是那么一两颗原子弹。在战场上使用原子弹,不仅对我们有害,对使用他们的美军也不利。还有,面对世界反对原子弹的舆论,美国政府在使用他们之前,必然会再三
General MacArthur is briefed on this and a mounting number of intelligence reports. He refuses to believe them. He says the Chinese must be volunteers fighting on their own. On the 24th of November, 1950, MacArthur flies over North Korea and along the Yalu River to reconnoiter for himself. What he sees makes him confident. There is no sign of the Chinese. All that spread before our eyes was an endless expanse of utterly barren countryside. Jagged hills, yawning crevasses, and the black waters of the Yalu, locked in the silent death grip of snow and ice. MacArthur sees nothing of China's immense army, 375,000 strong, now hiding in the mountains below. MacArthur makes a bold prediction. The war will be over, he says, by Christmas. Now, there's nothing did more for our morale that gave us more joy than that one sentence. You'll be home by Christmas. The Chinese are now confident of surprise. Maintaining an air of normalcy, Mao doesn't miss his usual Saturday night step around a Beijing dance floor. Mao has made a personal commitment to the Korean cause. His number one son, 28-year-old An Ying, is leaving for Korea to join the staff at the Army's field headquarters. In the skies, U.S. planes are on guard, hunting for enemy units. They get lucky. Mao's son was, uh, I think, stayed in a hut, the Korean peasant farmer's house, uh, home, and, and was destroyed. The airplane used uh, napalm or others that's burned. It's very effective. Mao's son was killed. But I think um, Mao took it as, as quite, um, you know, something that happened, it happened. Uh, you cannot uh, commit your son to, to your battlefield saying so he would be happy to return without. But it was a, sh a bad thing for Mao. By all accounts, the death of his son is a great blow to the Chinese leader. But if anything, this stiffens Mao's resolve. At that moment, the Chinese army is moving into final positions for an attack that will stun and surprise the US, almost on the scale of Pearl Harbor. China's generals now have a strategy to confront the UN army. We Tuesday, the 27th of November, in 23 below zero weather, the Chinese army and North Korean forces attack all along the front. So sudden and so colossal is the assault, the US and other UN forces begin an immediate and desperate retreat. At the Mao's mind, if you really want to stop the war, you really want to have a victory, you have to wipe out American units. In the snow, in the cold, U.S. forces gather their frozen dead. A retreat begins a deep withdrawal in the words of one U.S. general. The official U.S. history of the war does not shade its judgment, calling it the biggest and most humiliating retreat in U.S. history. 
Reporter Marguerite Higgins saw it happen. It has been a Korean Valley forge, and worse than anything in marine history. The terrible trek through the mountains cost more lives than Iwo Jima. There are nearly 5,000 Army and Marine casualties, including dead, missing, wounded, or frostbite cases. Never brush off the word frostbite. To many Marines, frostbite means amputated fingers, toes, feet, and legs. The calamity shakes the U.S. military leadership. MacArthur is unfazed and goes on the attack. Now that China is in the war, he declares, the U.S. should use its ultimate weapon, the atomic bomb. It is my belief that if allowed to use my full military might without artificial restriction, I could not only save Korea, but inflict such a destructive blow upon Red China's capacity to make aggressive war that it would remove her as a further threat to peace in Asia for generations to come. As the president who ordered the dropping of atomic bombs on Japan only five years earlier, Truman is conscious of the searing impact and determined not to go down in history as the man who did it again. He's also concerned now that the Soviets have the bomb, they might retaliate. He vetoes MacArthur's demand. But MacArthur and many US leaders continue to agitate for the use of the ultimate weapon against what another US commanding general calls the Asiatic hordes. I think the US side in general viewed Chinese communist government as perhaps the worst type of communism. They were not only commies, they were yellow commies. Yellow, this, this, you know, this, this like Mongol uh, 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 threatening. So you can say this has some traces of racism. Act one of the war ends, but the nightmares of those who fought it have only begun. I love you. I love all you guys. <laughs> Marines. Marines. I'm looking for my friend. Are you friend? He died. They are ghosts now, most of the teenage Marines who went to war with Don Gill. He can't get some scenes out of his mind. The night before their terrible battle stands out, they were around a campfire, dreaming of home. Gil remembers drinking from a metal cup that burned his lips. Gil figures that this was the last hour of his life, that he was at peace with himself. For at daybreak, all the boys went out and killed the soldiers they called the gooks, guys just about the same age as they were. Shot them through the chest and through the head as they lay in the corn everybody following orders. I, I first wrote a story about that day in 1950. I entitled the story, No Time for Prisoners. That has been a nightmare all my life. When you have taken life for really no rational reason, to watch it in a movie or on a theater is one thing, but to be part of it, when you don't want to be part of it. But if him and I in battle, and he's the enemy, I have no choice but to kill him, because if I don't, he may kill me. Yu Chun Do is tormented too. So many of her comrades died, and she has lived a long life. Before she dies, she wants to pay a debt. It is to the US sergeant who saved her life, because he said he had two daughters just like her. 
그래서 언젠가 그런 생각을 해. 선생님한테 했나. 언젠가 한만 냈으면 좋겠다. 그 만약에 그, 그 나이가 들었으니까 죽었으면 그 딸들이라도 만 냈으면 하는 생각이 했다고. 